Governance Academy um, webinar. Today we have, um, we're talking about the net zero guidelines and I see we have Emily online and uh, Axel's online. Um, please tell us where you're from. Uh, in the chat function, we also have emojis and reactions at the bottom. So if you like what we're saying, please um, clap or give us a high five, that would be great. Um, and yes, I see we've got some people from Jeffreys Bay. I'm expecting some other people online. Alan Carter, if you're online, Alan was actually instrumental in getting us to have this webinar. So thank you for your request. And I see Nimit is also online. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And I'm not going to take much more time because there's such a lot of information that we need to get through today in terms of what are directors and leaders' responsibilities when it comes to moving towards a net zero, carbon zero environment? So without that, I'd like, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome, first of all, Axel Kravatsky. Axel works in the uh, International Standards Organization, ISO. I've got, we'll invite uh, Daniel as well. Daniel's from the British Standards Institute and Emily also in terms of the project for these guidelines. So welcome to everyone. But you see that uh, chapter zero isn't represented here today. And unfortunately, uh, chapter zero couldn't make it today. But I'd like to ask Axel to tell us a little bit about chapter zero and why it's so important for this conversation. And Axel is actually a member of the chapter zero Romanian um, council. So Axel, if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, chapter zero, please. Great, thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to, and thank you for the invitation uh, to join this conversation. Um, chapter Zero was created in order to provide a network and uh, for independent directors on boards to take responsibility uh, for the domain and to be able to lead the conversation and shape organizational responses um, in the transition towards uh, net zero. And so it is really the place where independent directors can find resources, can find specialized guidance, and can find uh, a network of um, peers who all share the same issue and the same urgency, the same uh, problems of working together with their colleagues on the board and working together with management to ensure that the organizations are making that uh, transition. Thank you, Axel. And I see there's, there's chapters all over the world. They're busy establishing them all over the world. And you with Romania, what, what kind of activities do you do in Chapter Zero? The, I hear there's research and meetings. Have you, what kind of activities have you, ha has happened in Romania already? Right. So uh, we have organized uh, awareness raising sessions and information sessions um, by experts, both from uh, Chapter Zero in the UK international uh, Romania and uh, bring together, uh, we're focusing on different uh, parts of the principles relating to um, uh, the net zero transition and for boards to take uh, ownership of the topic. And so we bring together, we are basically helping uh, the, the board members to become familiar with the terminology to become uh, strengthened in the facts and the knowledge that drive the urgency of the matter, and then to equip them with the tools and uh, the, the practices around uh, setting strategy, uh, oversight, uh, disclosure, um, how to set targets, all the different topics that um, boards need to be actively engaged on uh, in. Um, mm -hmm. That's where we bring the expert together to discussed then within a national context. And by putting it into a national context, it gives you, uh, you know, we're able to speak to the realities of that particular market, of that particular society, and um, <clears throat> therefore give it greater relevance. Thank you, Axel. And we don't have any chapter zeros established in Africa as yet, but just to let everyone know that we are busy establishing one in South Africa at the moment. And then we will move into the rest of Africa and those discussions are underway. But you talk about the board and the board responsibilities, Axel. What I really want to hear about um, today is your involvement in ISO under the TC309. So TC, 
technical committee 309 is really the governance of organizations and you really you take a leadership role there can you just tell us about um what what you're doing there and the standards that you're busy developing there right so um the the bsi the the, the british standards institution or institute uh, has the the secretariat and the chair for that particular uh, technical committee, 309 governance of organizations. And it has partnered together with uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards. Uh, I'm a member of the Trinidad and Tobago um, Bureau of Standards National Mirror Committee. I'm chairing that um, and um, <clears throat> has partnered uh, uh, on in in two in two areas. One is at the chairing of the technical committee as a whole, and then also in the um, leadership of the working group one, which is on governance of organizations. So I'm active in two places, and uh, it brings together fifty five uh, participating countries. Uh, so that is members of ISO who have established national mirror committees and are able to establish a national consensus that then informs uh, their voting on international standards. Uh, because the guiding principle uh, of ISO is to establish consensus uh, globally and across stakeholder groups. And that means that at least about seven um, stakeholder groups uh, need to be consulted and engaged and consensus established at a national level which is then uh, reflected at the international level in the voting. And <clears throat> at the same time, there are also about 22 uh, observing countries. Observing countries can participate, but they cannot actively vote. And uh, they, their experts can take part, um, but um, they, have, they don't have that um, level of commitment to establish a national consensus at the national level but then they're able to vote on the overall um, adoption of a uh, standard mm -hmm. as all other countries are. And then finally, there are also about 25 uh, liaison organizations that are international nonprofit organizations that um, such as accounting, governance, risk, uh, OECD, World Bank, you know, a number of international organizations are um, liaisons who are liaising between the institutions. Mm -hmm. And so the core point, the, core, the, the, the reason I'm emphasizing this element is simply to speak to the, the unique function and feature of an international standard, which is to establish international consensus in a transparent, systematic uh, manner that then has the robustness to really reflect that international view to it, which is then you can see also linked to the net zeros uh, uh, guidelines, because in order for them to be, have the, the the power, you know, we need the world needs to agree on common terminology, it needs to agree on common topics, and until let's say, for example, uh, thirty seven thousand was published last year on guidelines for governance of organizations <laughs> guidelines, um, that uh, you know there was no international consensus on the practice of good governance. I can expand on other topics, but I think I leave it Thank at that you. for now. Yeah, thanks very much, Axel. And I think that it gives a, a great lead into what Emily and Daniel are going to be talking about. And I'll circle back and talk about that governance of organization standard and how that's built in uh, the sustainability aspects. But if I can now just head off to to Daniel and, and Emily, maybe Daniel, you can just tell us a little bit about, you know, how this standard fits in or this, whatever these guidelines are, a little bit of background. And, and Emily, I think you've also got a, a presentation, a slideshow that you can show for us as well. Thank you. Dan, I'll let you introduce and I'll offer the presentation up. Brilliant. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much, firstly, for the opportunity to present to, to you and um, Axel. I think you've queued us up. We didn't prepare this, but you've queued us up really nicely. So I think as Axel has said, and, and a lot of my thinking around this was that ISO is the place that the world comes to have really important conversations. Now, quite often they're quite boring and they're quite um, they're quite deep. And um, there's about 24,000, well, more than 24,000 international standards. So 
they really go into the details of everything that you see around around you. So if you're watching this from a laptop, there's, there's probably 230 standards or more that are being used in, in that laptop to make sure that it can talk to everyone else around the world. So it's all about interoperability. Before I go any further, I'm, I'm Dan Barlow. I'm, my role is head of um, innovation policy at BSI, um, but I'm also the founder of our 2050 world, which is, um, which is what Emily and I are, are here to talk to you about. And our 2050 world is the sort of the start, think of it almost like a startup within BSI, which is the UK's national standards body, one of 167 other national standards body, each appointed by government that um, is a member of ISO, where, where the world comes together and, and makes decisions on important things. So before I go into the net zero guidelines, I'll just talk to you a little bit about our 2050 world and the story about that, how that came to, came to be. And, and Emily's got a great pack that she'll, she'll go through and give you all of the details about what we've done and why. But our 2050 world um, came from preparations for COP26, um, obviously in 2021, um, based in Glasgow and BSI was thinking about what we could do there, how we could show that standards have these answers. And I was I was watching a um, um, a TED talk from Nigel Topping, really really good. I'll find the link when Emily's talking. I'll put it in the chat. Talking about what what more non-state actors, so businesses, need to do. And I recognised that actually what he was talking about was very much about um, international standards and the role that, that they could play. And I think the really interesting thing about international standards is that they can move across different regulatory boundaries and different jurisdictions in the same way that the emissions that we need to reduce in the atmosphere can. So it needs to be a global solution. So, um, so sort of from watching, from watching that um, presentation, I, I sort of got this I idea um, that we could do more proactively about how standards can support the race to zero and the, the huge amount of momentum that they've made. And very luckily got introduced to someone called Professor Thomas Hale. And Thomas Hale um, wrote a, a, a theory of change, a, a policy memo called the conveyor model, which talked about governance needed to get the world to net zero. And he talks about it as being starting from non-state actors. So they want to demonstrate that they're leaders. And I'd have thought many, many of the business leaders that are on this call would say that they're, they're doing it because they want to lead. But they need to be validated by um, voluntary initiatives. So sort of typically private standards that have been, been written by organisations that are really, really purposeful and really trying to drive, drive sort of upward pressure um, in, in the way that organisations think of net zero. But because there's so many of those and some can be good and some can be bad, you, you end up needing orchestration campaigns. Um, and that's sort of where it stopped. There wasn't really that scale, that detailed, quite boring sometimes scale into, into international standards which unfortunately meant that it was very, very difficult to see a path into, into regulation. And we, we recognised that there was something that standards can, can do there, but we weren't at, the, at, the, at that point doing it. So we formed this collaboration called Outcome to World with ISO, which you talked about already, the Race to Zero, which is the UN's campaign for non-state actors, representing, I think it's 15% of global GDP at the moment, and the United Nations Climate Change, the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub, which are looking at how can you spur on solution oriented innovation. And we commissioned some research that said that non-state actors are really struggling with what to do because there is so much material out there and it is so fragmented. So that was sort of the starting point for we need some authoritative alignment on, on what net zero is and, and how governance as well as organizations looking to contribute to it all fit together. And that's sort of the, the, sort of the, the, the aligning globe on the right hand side of, this, of the screen. Is meant to show that so that fragmented messy space going into alignment and very conv con um, conveniently it looks very much like the iso the iso logo as well so that's that was sort of our, our mission we launched at cop 21 um sorry cop 26 in 2021 and within one year we'd recruited recruited a team got the funding um, and launched um, the international workshop agreement process to build the net zero mm -hmm. guidelines and i'll let emily go into detail but i think we've We've managed to bring some real alignment. We had 1,200 people um, come together to support the development of the Net Zero Guidelines. Um, we've had huge numbers of downloads in our, in our first two weeks. I think the, the standard in terms of download rate is second only to ISO 9001. Um, and um, I, I really think that over the next, over the next sort of 12 months up going into COP28, we're going to see some real convergence. And I think the Net Zero Guidelines 
because of the importance of the platform that they were developed in, as Axel was saying, ISO where the world comes together, we're going to get some real traction and we're going to have far more certainty for business leaders. So that's sort of my opening opening waffle and a bit of a scene scene setter. So Emily, over over to you for the for some more detail on the exciting progress we think. Thanks very much, Dan. And um, morning, afternoon, evening to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining us on this. Um, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the work that's been delivered from the collaboration that Dan just spoke to you about. So as you can see from the bottom of your screen, um, this work is the output of a collaboration between ISO and its 167 national members around the world, the UN Race to Zero campaign and the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub, and in particular, the enormous amount of participants, organizations and experts that came together on the ISO platform to find a solution to the fragmentation of net zero. In simple terms, we're trying to help global actors, ambitious people and organizations such as yourselves, work out what good looks like for net zero and where you should be looking for guidance. Because net zero is a huge concept, a huge societal and economic uh, transformation uh, challenge and opportunity, but there are lots of composite parts to it. And we need to make it much clearer for people to understand how they go about it and how we can get ourselves back on track to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, which is, of course, as you all know, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees and certainly well below two. I think others on this call may know more than me, may be able to correct me, but I think the latest sort of stock taker estimate was that with all of the current commitments, we're still on track for something like 2.7 degrees warming world, um, which is not something I like to think about. So I hope that gives us a nice basis of urgency behind this work and how these guidelines can help you. So I'm going to jump straight in to answer what is the first question on your minds, which is uh, what are the net zero guidelines? So the net zero guidelines are a core reference text for credible net zero action. As I said, we're trying to answer the question of what good looks like. And in particular, we are trying to address the fragmentation problem that Dan just spoke to you about. Fragmentation doesn't necessarily mean disagreement, however. There is actually a huge amount of alignment in this space and a huge amount of agreement um, between different initiatives. The problem is, is there are just simply too many of them that only address, say, one part of the net zero uh, action and not all of it. The net zero guidelines draw on the existing landscape of major net zero standards and initiatives and helps bring together every stage of net zero action, everything from preparation, which is what we're here to talk about, your internal governance and setting up your organization to achieve net zero, all the way through to reporting and impact and everything else in between. These net zero guidelines can be used by any organization. And this is something that we were really clear on when we developed the scope of this project. Because at the moment, there's lots of standards out there for corporates. There are infrastructures like the Paris Agreement, the state actors, there are guidelines, uh, initiatives, frameworks, you name it. And we need to have a single document that the world can refer to and build upon when following and setting net zero guidance. And it's on that latter part I'll pick up now. So as you can see here, it says that the net zero guidelines can be used by any organization, but in particular, a key outcome of this work is that we would like to see these guidelines be adopted and used by what we call governance organizations in the document, or as you can think of them otherwise, rule setters for net zero guidance. So ISO is a great example. ISO is an international standard setter that creates standards, thousands and thousands of international standards that um, then are distilled down into national standards by national standards bodies. Now, if you are an organization that creates guidance for others, then all of our guidance that we set for others must conform to the same standardized vision for net zero. If that does not happen, we will fail to generate the alignment and acceleration we need to see in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. And it's for that reason that we are particularly interested in the role that rule setters for net zero guidance can play and how you can make sure that the rules you set for others comply with this globally agreed idea of net zero. It's aimed to support actors at the national, regional, city and individual organisational level to achieve their net zero action. Because while we talk about state and non-state actors, ultimately we are all actors in the race to net zero and we need to make it much clearer about what all of our roles are to play in helping us get to 1.5 degrees. So 
In summary, the net zero guidelines are a single set of guidelines that draw on the existing net zero landscape and help you navigate at any level that you're working at what you should be doing and what good looks like and what key considerations are that you should build in to your net zero strategy. Picking up a bit more about uh, the background that Dan was speaking to you about earlier, I want to talk through about uh, the theory of change developed by Professor Tom Hale that Dan mentioned earlier that we've used to develop this work. So this is really exciting. This is something called the conveyor belt model for global net zero governance. And it was published by the University of Oxford last year and has formed the basis for much policy discussion and debate at the national, international and UN level. In simple terms, what you can see on the right hand side of your screen is what we call a voluntary space. So you can think about uh, major campaigns like the UN Race to Zero campaign. You can think about um, sort of uh, activism or you can think about uh, campaigners, those who come up with innovation, uh, clear messaging, those who have pushed global debate uh, so far in the last 30 years and have got us to the place of progress we're at. However, what they lack is the, the teeth, the binding levers of governance that allow us to embed and enforce rules on net zero, which you can see on the left hand side of the, mod of the model, which is national policy and regulation. The exciting bit about the net zero conveyor belt model is that it puts the international standard system in the middle as this missing link, this key global infrastructure that we need to better leverage to scale the innovation and agility and best practice from the voluntary space over to the left hand side into our government policy and regulation. Because what we're ultimately trying to get to is a level playing field and a globally enforced idea of what net zero is. It will make things easier for business who are desperate for a, a level playing field so that you don't have to worry about taking these steps and the impact it has on uh, your competitiveness in your market. It will ensure that governments are taking the responsibility that they should be taking for supporting and driving this uh, transition of our economy. And it will also mean that all of the great ideas and innovations that the voluntary space is developing don't just stay voluntary. We need to move from voluntary governance to embedded operational governance in regulation if we are to get to the goals of the Paris Agreement. And as you can see in the middle of your screen, the net zero guidelines represent this first major step in this theory of change. Scaling and drawing upon the existing landscape, as I just mentioned, and the voluntary space and scaling it across global markets and sectors through the international standard system. So in this case, we're talking about ISO, which can then put it in the position to be embedded into national policy and regulation, which in particular is driven by these big global moments, um, such as the, the COP summits, which really focus governments, businesses, and all actors on what we can all collectively do for climate change. That is how we bind best practice into government policy and regulation. And that is the key role that the net zero guidelines plays in helping us get there. And as you can see, we continue to go around and around in this model. As more innovation, more ambition, more capacity is scaled up, this will then feed through into this reciprocal conveyor belt model. So that is why we are here today speaking to you about the net zero guidelines, because we want to make it really clear about what role you have to play in this wider theory of change and how we can help you reach our net zero goals. I've mentioned already about the UN and the international interest in this work. I'm sure many of you who are here to hear about net zero are already aware of the problem of greenwashing. So greenwashing, for those of you who are not familiar the term, with the term, is the phenomenon we're encountering in the absence of a clear framework of standards and regulation, where um, many businesses and organisations are aware that they need to be doing something for climate, but in uh, lacking the clear standards and regulations to tell them what good looks like and how to go about it, um, are rushing to uh, claim or portray themselves as being sustainable or net zero or climate positive or carbon neutral or something of the like without the proper infrastructure standards and verification to support that claim. This confusion is contributing to the spread of greenwashing and damaging consumer trust. And it's also why on the global level, we are so far off the goals of the Paris Agreement that we urgently need to reach by the mid-century, according to the IPCC. So in this context, the UN Secretary General appointed a high-level expert group 
to look at the uh, integrity of net zero commitments by non-state actors earlier this year, uh, otherwise known as the HLEG for those of you who are already familiar with this work. And these experts consulted around the world to identify key recommendations that the UN Secretary General gave at COP27, published under this report, Integrity Matters. And it set out 10 key recommendations um, about what good looks like and how we fill this integrity gap and really reduce the, rate, the rates of greenwashing that we are currently seeing. The net zero guidelines is critical to that. And actually, ISO was name checked multiple times in the UN's Integrity Matters report as a result of the guidance and clarity that this work is bringing. So before I move on, the key takeaway from this point is if you're not aware of the Integrity Matters report, we really encourage you to read it when looking at your net zero governance and that the net zero guidelines, the really key tool and action guide that you can use to ensure that you are aligned with these recommendations and help you understand not just about what net zero action looks like, but also about what it isn't. So the process, lots of people have uh, asked many questions about this. How did we develop these global net zero guidelines? So I'm going to take you through a few key headlines to bear in mind. So we've already said that the net zero guidelines were developed on the ISO platform, which is, as Dan said earlier, rightfully so, ISO is a platform where experts can come together and agree by consensus, as Axel really highlighted earlier as well, um, what a solution to a problem, a shared problem looks like. So the key things to know is that it was developed through a process on the ISO platform called an International Workshop Agreement or an IWA. And this is a uh, very inclusive, agile process, which we chose deliberately for the purpose of this uh, task. We knew that the climate crisis is urgent. It is a global problem. People are crying out for clarity on what good looks like and we simply cannot take years to agree on this. The world has been debating for decades already. We need clear guidance and we need it now. The IWA process allowed us to convene over 1,200 organizations and individual experts from over 100 countries in a matter of months and through a series of workshops and written commenting windows, develop these net zero guidelines in just three months. We began in July and concluded in mid-September and thanks to the fantastic work of ISO colleagues, the document was published at COP27 with two languages available, with a third, fourth of, and fifth due to be published soon and more on the way. We're really keen that these guidelines truly are global, are accessible, and that people can read them in their own native languages. Because if we want to get the world to 1.5, we need to make sure that everyone understands what they need to do uh, and it's accessible to them. And on that bringing together point, the final point I'd like to point out about the process is its goal of harmonizing. So this is not just a new standard. Lots of people say, oh, not another new standard, not another new thing. But actually, that is not what the net zero guidelines are. The net zero guidelines were mapped um, through research led by the University of Oxford across the 33 most globally prominent net zero standards and initiatives to bring this whole fragmented picture together. That was what the seed document was and the document that all of these participants in these workshops then iterated upon. So that is what the net zero guidelines are and what they are based on. It's not another new standard to confuse you. It is a deliverable from the ISO platform that brings together what's already out there. So finally, what did the net zero guidelines say? After all this discussion, all these workshops, what did we land on and what does the document cover? So I've already said that the guidelines are quite distinctive in the sense that they provide an end-to-end -end map, if you like, of net zero action, right the way from preparation all the way through measurement target setting to reporting and impact. They include a definition of net zero and related terms, which again sought to harmonise all the different definitions out there and find agreement and consensus and clarity on them. A set of net zero guiding principles, which you'd consider as key considerations that should be embedded into every aspect of your net zero decision making and strategy. Guidance on how you can contribute to the global net zero target of, set out in the Paris Agreement of 1.5 that I, I keep mentioning. And then more detailed recommendations on governance, target setting, transparent communication and consistent reporting. And as I said on that harmonising point, the guidelines also uniquely signpost to other relevant prominent initiatives and standards, including ISO standards, that, prefer, that, that provide you with further, more detailed methodology and verification services as needed. 
because it's going to be quite a challenge to summarize such a detailed document, I thought I would pull out some key topics that might be most of interest to this group and tell you what the position is on them. So beginning with the obvious for net zero, fossil fuels. There is a huge amount of debate about this at every COP summit. Um, and the net zero guidelines found consensus on what is also the latest global position on fossil fuels, which is to transition away from the dependence on fossil fuels and apply policies to phase them out with a particular name check on unabated coal use. So this again builds on global best practice of, for example, the race to zero 3.0 criteria and also reflects those agreements made at the global level. Scope 3 emissions, all of you I'm sure are already well aware of the challenge that Scope 3 produces and also the confusion around um, how you should go about looking at your Scope 3 emissions in the Net Zero strategy. So the Net Zero guidelines are clear that all Scope 3 emissions should be accounted for, not just in your long-term Net Zero target, which could be, for example, by 2050, but also in your interim target. So those milestones you set along the way on your path to your Net Zero goal. Um, the other section it covers is also the other question it covers is also on greenhouse gases. So lots of us, I'm sure, have set or have seen net zero carbon strategies, or we hear things like zero carbon terminology used. The net zero guidelines are very clear that all greenhouse gases should be accounted for in your net zero strategy, not just as can commonly be uh, seen carbon dioxide. CO2 has, of course, a huge contribution to uh, the warming of our planet, but it is not the only greenhouse gas we need to think about, and certainly not even the most potent. Uh, the UN Convention on, on Methane is a great example of why we need to be paying attention to other greenhouse gases, and you should be seeking to account for all of them in your net zero strategy. Use of offsets is also a very contentious and much debated topic in net zero, and something that uh, there is de a desperate need for clarity on. So the net zero guidelines state that only removal based offsets should be used in a net zero strategy. And the reason for that is because net zero is defined um, as uh, re uh, deep reductions of your emissions down to uh, 90 or 95 percent. And only those remaining hard to abate emissions um, should be offset or counterbalanced. By removals. If we're not physically removing the emissions from the atmosphere, then we will not achieve that net zero balance of greenhouse gases. So reduction based offsets should not be used when trying to claim net zero only removals. I've just covered a, a residual emissions there, but as you can see, there are only emissions that are left over after uh, your deep emissions reductions have been completed, which uh, the common best practice agrees is around five to 10%. Um, should be what you should use offsets uh, to counterbalance and claim net zero. So I, we're aware of the challenge of this, but nevertheless, the science is very clear on this. If you want to achieve net zero, that is what you must do in order to make a credible claim. So those residual emissions are those remissions that are only uh, remaining after you have completed your deep emissions reductions by 90%. And of course, the guidelines does have further caveats in about different sectoral strategies um, and that's why that disclaimer is there at the bottom to make sure that you do consult the full, the full net zero guidelines document for these nuances as this is of course just a presentational summary. The last point on this slide that I'll, I'll come over to is interim targets so again as supported by the UN and Tech Do Matters report that came out of COP27 global best practice agrees that a good net zero strategy should contain interim targets you should, as an organization, be working out where you should be at intervals every, at least every five years on your journey to net zero. This is not just for something to add to reporting burden. It should actually be looked at as a really helpful tool that will help you as an organization work out how you're doing, where you're off track, so you can take the appropriate measures needed early enough to help you get back on track if you are running into problems. We should not be using this as a reason to delay action until later years, but making sure that we have a very clear plan with interim milestones on the way. Some further topics to pull out is on governance, leadership and responsibilities, because of course, this is something that this forum is particularly interested in. Um, so uh, a few points I'll pull out here. The guidelines has an entire section 
on leadership and responsibilities, which really uh, cover that sort of preparation stage of your net zero target. So how do you, as an organization, get yourself set up for net zero and make sure that you are doing things in a credible, high integrity way? So the first thing, and this is something that normally organizations aren't having any problems with, is that your leadership in your organization should be making a very clear public commitment to reaching net zero. It should be something that your customers, your investors, your stakeholders should be able to find out whether you have a net zero target. Net zero should be prioritized in your organizational strategy and decision making. It should not be considered a separate additional priority or an afterthought in um, your governance and in your organizational strategy, but an integral consideration to everything you do and how your operations function. To that point, you should be incorporating your net zero targets and commitments into your core governance documents, whether that's charters or bylaws or internal policies. It should not be something that remains only a public commitment or a press release, but something that's embedded into every part of how your organization works. You should be appointing competent members to leadership to take responsibility um, for all of this work, because if you don't have people that are equipped uh, and uh, upskilled to take responsibility and oversight for your net zero strategy, then your organization may struggle to take the right decisions at the right time or identify challenges or obstacles when they emerge. And the guidelines does offer a definition of leadership and of competence to help you be clearer on whether you fulfill that criteria or not. Aligning internal processes and public lobbying. So this is also something that the UN Secretary General's report picked up and something that the Net Zero Guidelines is quite clear on. At the moment, we do still have in the current environment a situation where uh, some parts of organisations are very public and prioritising Net Zero while we're continuing to have uh, funding, investment, um, uh, associations or other links with organisations or entities that are continuing to lobby against um, or stall climate action. So a, a clear thing that the Net Zero Guidelines recommends is that your organisation should be looking at your uh, relationships, your uh, stakeholders, your funders, your supply chain, your trade associations, etc., and making sure that your relationships and what you're funding and contributing to align with your public targets for net zero. This is in particular related to how we align the world and how we push governments to take the responsibility for climate action, because if we can send the right market signals that we actually do want these policies to be prioritized and these regulations to be accelerated and stop lobbying against them through other relationships or other um, links that we may have, this is how we will start to see these crucial results. And finally, and this might be um, sort of a, a surprise um, to some who have not yet read the, the Integrity Matters report, but the global consensus has arrived that we should now be looking to align executive compensation with progress against net zero targets. This again links to the point above on screen, which is about making sure the public commitments and incentives align with what we're doing internally. If the right incentives aren't there, we cannot expect organizations to take the pivot towards ambition uh, and accelerate their net zero targets as we need. This is the final slide before we move on uh, to sort of how you can use it and some questions that you all may have. But picking up on some other contentious points that people may need some, some clarity on, the guidelines also cover uh, avoided emissions or what some of you may know as scope four emissions and are very clear that avoided emissions cannot be counted towards your net zero target. So many people don't know what avoided emissions are and the, and the guidelines do provide a definition, but a, a sort of a, a, an example I could use to bring it to life is uh, that we are all working together and, and joined together on this uh, virtual workshop. Uh, none of us have needed to take a plane to all be in the same room in order to have this discussion. And we are using Zoom to do that. This does not mean, however, that Zoom, the company, could count this meeting as a reduction towards their own emissions just because it has allowed us to not take a plane to meet each other. That would be an inaccurate representation of how Zoom is reducing its own emissions. So that is an example you can use to understand that concept and make sure that when you're looking at your own net zero targets and strategy, um, you are not by accident uh, counting these uh, examples towards your own emissions reductions. 
However, the positive is, and I think this is a really exciting um, incentive for business, is that avoided emissions should be framed as how you can act as a solution provider to others. So much of the best practice and innovation uh, and tools that businesses and other organizations are developing for others that might enable them to reduce their emissions is still something that we should be striving for. And I know many major stakeholders globally, there's a lot of discussion about this at COP, are looking into how more detailed guidance um, can be developed on this to help people really take advantage of their ability to act as solution providers to others. But nevertheless, key things to take away are they should not be counted towards your net zero target and they should not be confused with offsetting emissions either. That is a distinct separate concept. Fair share and a just transition. Now, after having a summit like COP27, which was branded by many as sort of the African COP and really shining a light on uh, climate justice and asking for those with great historical responsibility to agree on a loss and damage fund for those most affected by the climate crisis, it's not surprising that the net zero guidelines covers fair share too, and it was also the subject of the UN report. In summary, the net zero guidelines are clear that those with greater historical responsibility and greater resources to act should be making a proportionately greater contribution and supporting others with less capacity to act to take action. We're all aware of the disproportionate resources and capacity that different parts of the world have to contribute to net zero, but this is a shared problem and it needs a shared solution. And we must ensure that those larger well resourced organizations and countries and territories are taking on their proportionate role in not only meeting their own emissions reductions targets, but supporting others to meet theirs too. And there's more detail about that in the guidelines on the section wider impact and equity. Nature and biodiversity, I'm speaking to you during COP15, which is of course the biodiversity COP that is going on in Montreal as we speak. And I'm sure your feeds are full to the brim with news about nature, and biodiversity, how we leverage uh, high integrity, high quality nature-based solutions, but also how we protect biodiversity and the critical ecosystems upon which we all depend. So the net zero guidelines are clear that any mitigation strategy must, as an integral consideration, be taking into account how it preserves uh, nature and biodiversity. This has come up throughout the document, and it's something that we want to make really clear if your net zero strategy does not account for biodiversity or its impact on nature at all, it is not a good net zero strategy and it should be revised to make sure these considerations are built in. Thank you all for hanging with me. There's only three more topics, I promise. <laughs> uh, one that I'm sure all of you may be uh, very interested in is net zero claims. So there's lots of uh, problems about understanding of claims and greenwashing. Um, so we are very clear that uh, to claim net zero, it should only be those residual remaining emissions uh, that you have left over after you completed your deep emissions reductions uh, that should be counterbalanced by removal based offsets. So you should not be offsetting your way to net zero. Um, if you are doing that, if, you're, if your strategy relies on, say, 40, 50 percent offsets, then that's something that you need to go back and look at again and consult on the best practices and standards that we signpost to. Um, you may, however, be able to look at alternative claims like carbon neutrality, which can be thought of as a point on the path to net zero, and ISO has its 14068 carbon neutrality standard under development at the moment, which will give you more resources to do that. Last point on removals. As I've said, only removal-based offsets can be used to counterbalance your residual emissions, but these also do need to meet certain criteria. They should be high quality, and the key thing to really pay attention to with removals is the permanence of its storage. So if you're going to physically remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, for example, it needs to stay removed. Otherwise, we may say achieve net zero and then lose that balance again because uh, gases that we have previously removed and stored have then leaked back out into the atmosphere. So net zero is a state that we must sustain once we reach it. And so ensuring that the removals you use to uh, permanently or sufficiently long term store those greenhouse gases is really key for a good net zero strategy. And on reporting, leadership of organisations should be accountable for making sure that you have the appropriate uh, reporting oversight and verification processes built in. Um, and you should be using a verifiable um, 
transparent reporting process to make sure that the claims you're making, the, the data you're providing, and the progress you're making can all be checked by a third party. And again, we signpost you to more uh, standards and processes you can use to help sure that you do that. For those of you who have hung on, I'm incredibly impressed. I know there's a huge amount of information and uh, we'll send you these packs so you can digest it in your own time. But the final thing to really just uh, take away from this is that if you have a net zero strategy, you should be downloading the net zero guidelines from iso.org forward slash net zero to review this alongside the guidelines and identify any gaps that you currently have, which may or may not align to some of the points that I've just outlined to you. You can then use these recommendations and the other standards and initiatives that we signpost you to in the guidelines to revise your strategy and ensure that your net zero guidance meets that threshold for integrity that the UN is really calling on us all to um, update our guidelines with. So I'll leave that on screen for you to take in as needed, but thank you very much to everyone who has uh, listened to this presentation and uh, really look forward to discussing it with you all and helping you use this to support your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. That was a, a lot to take in and the video, <laughs> it will be available on the event page so we can always go back. And of course, uh, all of the, the papers that you referred to and, and the source material is sitting on the event page too. So uh, thank you very much for that overview. And as Bill Nelson said on, on the chat, uh, you know, we are needing this right now. This is so timely because um, people are walking into boardrooms going, and what are we doing? So talking about boardrooms and uh, governing bodies and boards, et cetera, uh, I'd like to now ask Axel to weigh in. So we know, and obviously everybody's from different countries here, and welcome to everyone from all, the, all around the world, but um, there is an international standard, as you were saying, for the governance of organizations. And what Emily was talking about is really all of these leadership requirements, um, commitment, prioritizing, governance documents, uh, making sure you've got the right competencies, internal processes, and of course, remuneration and compensation, incentivization, really. How does the ISO 37000 standard deal with sustainability and build in these kinds of leadership requirements um, in, in the standard itself? And you're on mute, 2021 error. <laughs> Uh, I must agree with everybody that Emily's presentation was very good. And I uh, <clears throat> would like to basically maybe pick up on the, one of the places where she started uh, about the fragmentation and mm -hmm. how do we transform this? And so ISO 37000 introduced, uh, it was not the first to use the term, but it has based its whole framework around it of integrated governance. So it's it's really about thinking in an integrated way. If before this time, you were able to ignore the consequences of what you do or the impact that you have on people or resources. And now there is no doubt that it is not good governance, no matter how much profit you make, uh, if you are even unaware of what your consequences are. So bringing that back home, bringing that in uh, is very important. And I think also a little bit like Emily and <laughs> Daniel, I is not coming short on Daniel, but you know, and everybody involved in this process, um, you know, it is also about reducing complexity. So there are so many dimensions that need to be governed that it is always useful to have a sort of a source document and to have the basic principles clear. And so uh, I think, you know, it is super welcome from a board's perspective, from a governing body perspective to have sort of definitive clarity to say, okay, this is what it is. It will change eventually, it can change, but at the moment, this is the source document that we're gonna be referring to. And it brings together many other topics. So in a similar way, 37,000 is doing a similar kind of job. It is looking at all the developments and all the <clears throat> transformations that are taking place, which have been huge in the field of governance. And it is bringing this down into some basic principles and even a definition. So usually, you know, when you say about governance, you know, they, everybody comes with a favorite definition, but now luckily we have a simple definition, which is, you know, 
which it, it, that it involves to direct, to oversee, and to account for an organization in fulfilling its purpose, its defined purpose. Um, uh, and so having this clarity and reducing that complexity is part of it uh, and the integration. So as I, know, I said three things, but I can expand on how it links to the different principles because there are many topics which a governing body now needs to engage with. Um, let's say, for example, even to account, are we accounting the right things? So it is very good that in the standard, in the net zero standard, we have a list to say, these are the topics, and this is the manner in which you expect to, to account for it. Now, you will have stock exchange regulations. You will have other regulations that are mandatory regulations. Those take precedent, and you, thou shall do that. And in addition to that, in order to be good governance, this is the recommended profile. So even though the stock exchange may, or the you know any regulator may require much less of you, this is what good is defined as. And so having this clarity, I think it's uh, very welcome and uh, important. Thank you, Axel. I was just um, popping in the the, the um, chat here, um, the, an overview. I'll put a link there in the overview slide deck to ISO 37000. Um, a question that's coming up, there's quite a few questions here, but the, maybe just to start with the first one. Um, and to Emily and Daniel, um, how, how does this align with SBTI? Can I say that, Dan, or shall I? Oh, I, I will begin. <laughs> Chime in if I miss anything. Um, so great question, and as I'm sure you won't be surprised, this is something that we get a lot. So um, the first thing to know is that SBTI was part of the process, part of uh, the development of the net zero guidelines, and we draw on much of their best practice, particularly on points by roads like residual emissions um, and offsets. So SBTI is integrated and part of those 33 primary global initiatives I mentioned. In terms of the difference, we need to, again, step back and think about what net zero is as a composite part. So the net zero, the SBTI corporate standard is a corporate standard for net zero, and in particular covers the target setting and reporting aspect of net zero. But actually, there are other considerations in, in net zero that we need to take account for. So a great example of things that the net zero guidelines covers um, is things about uh, the guidance on a just transition, um, which SBTI currently doesn't. You can also see some differences in terms of the scope we use. So the net zero guidelines are designed to be used by all organizations, whereas the SBTI uh, net zero standard is designed to be used um, by corporations. So these don't need to be competitive concepts. They're actually incredibly complementary. And that goes back to the harmonization point. It's about making sure that those who are not aware of SBTI can find it if they need further guidance for target setting, but are also aware of how that fits in to the wider considerations of net zero that SBTI doesn't yet cover. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think just uh, one thing I'd like to add is, of course, this is we're speaking largely about the E, and although we've got some of the just transition, the social aspects, and uh, Axel's talking about the G, we mustn't forget the social aspects. And it's very much um, part of, and I, I know we've got debate around the ESG acronym, and it really is all sustainability. But if we can just take those pillars, I think there is, an, there is another pillar. So we mustn't be tunnel visioned here. Here is a, a brilliant piece of guidance on specific a specific matter. And I think although you know we need to use this and apply it as leaders, we also need to be cognizant of the integrated nature, as Axel was saying, of all of the other aspects that have a, a role to play in sustainability. And I did put a link there to the ESG exchange, where certainly uh, a how-to playbook in terms of applying these leadership guidelines and these guidelines in an organization will come through as a how-to playbook but also the, the other how-tos of, of the integration of the other aspects. So I did put the link there um, to the ESG exchange. Of course, um, I just want to touch on the sustainability aspects and the one thing around um, ISO 37000 that's really quite important. And I know we've got the, um, 
you know, the SASB outside in approach to uh, monitoring and accountability, you've both spoken, you've all spoken about um, from the outside in, of course, in ISO 37,000 under the, the viability and performance over time, it very clearly says it has to be the concept of the, the two parts, the double materiality. So applying the ISO standard from an, um, 37,000, which is internationally agreed, there is international consensus that we need to think of these things in both from both perspectives. So I just want to lead into a, a, a question here. It's kind of talking about double materiality, but really Emmanuel was asking about the circular economy. How is that considered in with these guidelines? And Emily, I could see you rearing to go. <laughs> I always am. Everyone can tell you, but it's, it's hard to shut me up once I get going on all this. It's very, very exciting topic. Lovely. <laughs> um, so, uh, circular economy is a, a great question to raise. Um, so, while the net zero guidelines covers um, all the interconnected considerations and links, um, it doesn't go into detailed guidance on circular economy. It does, however, name check it as a consideration um, when you develop your your mitigation strategy or your plans. So. For example, it encourages organisations to um, examine the potential to use alternative processes, for example, in line with circular economy practices to help bring down your emissions. Um, while it doesn't aim to be prescriptive and sort of say these are the only ways you can go about doing this, it does give you a detailed list of possible actions you can take to help you meet your scope one, scope two and scope three targets. And that is where the circular economy principles come in. Um, but we did have um, organisations that specialise in the circular economy uh, register to join the process and um, have followed it with a lot of interest. Because, again, we don't need to be experts in circular economy. We just need to make sure that circular economy is integrated into net zero. And then everyone can go and um, pursue more detailed methodology from those experts as needed. Thank you. We've got three minutes left, so a minute each. Um, what can people do immediately following this webinar? What, what do you want people to do differently? And maybe start with Axel. Yeah, so <clears throat> the for me, the simple, the simple uh, framework, I, <clears throat> I always go back to the first principle. So the first principle is, as when you govern, and the governance takes place at the organization as a whole, but also its subcomponents, there are always three functions, to direct, to oversee, and to account for that which you, you are responsible uh, for. And in doing that, I think the guidelines give you a very nice uh, uh, detailed outline. So, you know, you don't have to send anybody away and say, come and give me a summary. This is a summary. And it tells you when you assess, you assess these dimensions. When you commit, you need to make commitments about these topics. When you transform, you need to transform these topics. And when you disclose, you need to disclose these topics. So to me, it gives a, a governing body a very clear guidance in terms of what to direct about, what do you need to oversee? So what controls do I need to put in? What, to, what reports do I need to find? What do I need to incentivize, track, blah, blah. And finally, uh, what are we transforming? What difference are we actually making so that we are actually able to also report on the actual difference that we're making and we're not greenwashing, and we are actually a good, a well-governed uh, organization. Mm. Thanks, Axel. And as Ozo says in the in the Q and A, uh, it is the whole board together. It's the whole governing body together. Thanks, Axel. Um, maybe Daniel. Daniel, last point from your side. Yeah, so I'll, I'll um, avoid the obvious of go to ISO.org for slash net zero down as a standards bit. I'd say say more broadly, as, as Axe was saying, we, we actually shared a, a very brief comment in the chat around um, a, a new standard that's coming out, PAS 808 on purpose-driven organisations. And I read that off the back of, of reading ISO 37,000, the ISO 37,000 series. And I think there is so much that you need to think about as, a, as, as business leaders that are trying to do public good as you were talking about Carolyn as well. And I think just be really, really clear on what your purpose is. And actually, if you think about purpose long enough, long-term ambition for everyone is, is good health for people and planet. 
the net zero guidelines does something really, really well, which is that common reference point. But there is far more that you need to do as well. But the clearer you can be on that purpose, the more likely you are to, to, to do that good. Thank you, Daniel. Emily? I think that I could be said has been said, but it's more just to thank everyone for listening. Thank you for all dedicating your time to thinking about this important question on what good governance looks like for net zero um, and to just really work through this list of recommendations, look at the standards we signpost you and keep watching this space as the discussion around net zero integrity, integrity and greenwashing develops. We aim to see a real convergence on the same common set of guidelines by the time we arrive at COP28. So join us and make sure that you are part of the leading bunch by the time we get there. Thank you, everyone. Lovely. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, Daniel. Really appreciate your time. And thank you, everyone, for attending. The video and recording will always be available on the event page. So please share the event page broadly. Get your other board members that weren't in attendance here to watch the video. I uh, really appreciate your time and your commitment to this initiative. Very, very important initiative. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Take care.